Hi everyone, my name is Boniface Massa. I'm from Malawi. I was in the 2018 Mandela Washington Fellow and I was placed at the Presidential Princeton. Each time I'm engaged in this fellowship, I learn a lot. And it also helps me to start reflecting on my values and my roles as an individual, but also as a young leader in my society. My expertise is in promoting rights of people with disabilities. And for the past four or five years, I've focused much on the rights of people with albinism. As you're aware, across Africa, the majority of us have been targeted for ritual killings, and we're still living in, in danger. We're still living in hiding. We don't trust anyone around us. But as individuals with albinism, we choose to fight for our own rights. We choose to be in the battlefront to defend our own rights and the rights of people with disabilities across the world. Now that we're going through the pandemic, it's an opportunity for us as readers to start reflecting what has changed in our society. The COVID-19 pandemic has really led to changes in our society. But these changes should not push us away, should give us an opportunity as young people, even as activists or advocates who are promoting rights of people with disabilities. We must stand up as leaders to ensure that even in this difficult moment, that's where leadership is very critical. That's where we need to improve our skills to deal with the changing environment in our society. So to my fellow young leaders who have been selected in the 2021 cohort, I wish to encourage you all to take this opportunity. We must stand up and show courage that even in these shrinking spaces due to COVID, quarantine, isolation, the few of us who are champion rights of people with disabilities should stand up and defend the rights of people with disabilities across the world. We are live. A very warm welcome to you from wherever it is you're watching or listening to this from. A welcome to the 2021 Mandela Washington Fellowship Summit. The Mandela Washington Fellowship Summit is the signature culminating event of the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program, which empowers and provides young African leaders with a unique opportunity to connect with fellow car and current fellowship alumni and prestigious guests from U.S. institutions who have an interest in Africa. And I welcome you to the very first virtual summit panel discussion on the youth leadership response to the social and economic impact of the public health crisis. My name is Babata Ndeoklola, your moderator for this event. I'm a journalist and documentary maker working in the north central part of Nigeria, where I tell underreported stories ranging from health to other development issues. I'm also a 2019 Mandela Washington Fellow myself and alumna of the prestigious Rutgers State University, state of New Jersey, under its leadership and civic engagement program. And let me say quickly that this is such a huge honor and I celebrate you all for joining us. Due to the global COVID-19 pandemic, and with the health, safety, and well-being of fellows and partners as the highest priority, the U.S. Department of State has planned this virtual fellowship for 2021. And over the past fellows, over, over the past weeks, fellows have uh, participated in virtual leadership institutes, which have included leadership trainings, networking, mentoring, and professional development. And the 2021 Mandela Washington Fellowship Summit is a culmination of this event. This year's conference theme is Leadership for the Future, Resilience and Inclusion. And this particular session is titled Leading and Innovating During a Public Health Crisis. The anticipated length of the session is 45 minutes. That's from now till 10 a.m. But I know we have different uh, time zones as well. Uh, it's short, but I promise it's going to be interactive. So let's get straight to it. I'm not alone. I have the privilege of introducing to some and the honor of making known to some others our delightful panelists for this conversation today. And first on the list is uh, Nicolette Nusain, who serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Healthcare Ready, where she works to meet present patients' needs before, during, and after natural disasters, disease outbreaks, and catastrophic events. Uh, Dr. Nicolette, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. All right. 
it's good to have you. Also joining me on this panel discussion is uh, John Kangasong, who currently serves as the director of the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention, a specialized technical institution of the African Union. John, it's good to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the, the program. And last but not the least, we have Louis Pace, who is the director of the Office of Global Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's an honor having you on. Hi, Baba 2J. Pleasure to be with you all today. All right. I feel like uh, that introduction's a bit brief. So very quickly, um, I'm going to let the uh, panelists uh, introduce themselves within the scope of this conversation that is dealing with uh, pandemics and the present COVID situation, and then we'll cut straight to it. Uh, don't forget, we have some questions right around 9.40. Uh, we'll be uh, bringing you questions and having them read or shown uh, live. That's as relates to this conversation. So sit tight and uh, let's get started. So I'd like to start off this uh, particular session. Let's get started with uh, you, Nicolette. Uh, tell us about yourself, about oh, what you do. I know time's the only thing we don't have, but I know there's so much to pack into a minute or so, but let, let's have it. Sure. Um, so I run an organization that was originally founded about 15 years ago to serve as a public private partnership um, between um, parts of the healthcare supply chain. So the people that develop, make, move, dispense drugs, medicines, medical products um, with the government, recognizing that in those moments of catastrophe, there need to be already established coordination points, flows of information um, and trusted partnerships that will allow for our government partners, whether they be um, in the United States, you know, our emergency management agencies or our public health departments, um, identifying where the needs are, what they are looking to do, um, and those members of the private sector that would have those products and have the ability to move them to where they're needed. So that's what um, we do is to make sure that that partnership remains in place, even when there isn't a disaster. And then when there is a crisis and we need to activate it, we're able to activate that partnership in a way that allows for us to get medical supplies and medical support to the communities that need it most. All right. Well, uh, very well. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm sure that's the abridged version of a whole lot, but thank you so much for giving us that. Uh, let's go on to John. Uh, John Kangasan, uh, thank you. Honor to have you. What it is that you do for our audiences. No, thank you. I, again, and, um, a pleasure to join my co panelists, uh, Nicolette and Lois, and longtime colleagues at a very important platform. And it's truly a joy to join you from Addis Ababa uh, because I believe in what you are doing. Uh, leadership is key, especially um, the, young, uh, the, the, the young generation for tomorrow. I, I serve as the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is a relatively young organization. It's four and a half years old, which was created after uh, as a spin-off of uh, another crisis, health crisis that we faced it was uh, at that time, about five years ago, the Ebola uh, crisis. We all talk about COVID today, but uh, before COVID, what uh, disturbed all of us most was uh, uh, Ebola and uh, how devastating it was uh, in West Africa. And that led the, the head of states of Africa to come together and uh, establish, the, uh, launch the Africa CDC. And um, Africa CDC is known as uh, the fastest institution that has ever been developed within the African Union. Uh, uh, because of, I mean, you know how slow and bureaucratic the African Union can be. But uh, I say that because the Africa CDC is an expression of what I call a, a strong political innovation for the continent, which ex expresses the wisdom and vision of our head of states. Uh, if this was an investment in a stock market, I would have, I would say that um, uh, that investment yielded tremendously for those uh, the founding um, head of states of, of the Africa CDC. So that is what I do. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, last but not the least, uh, Lois Space, you have the floor. Well, how do I uh, put it into um, such a short time frame? I've been running this Office of Global Affairs. Um, within the federal government for our Department of Health just for about six months. 
Uh, so I still feel fairly new in the role. Uh, we do a range of things, actually. Um, there's a lot that we um, try and do on the global policy level, uh, working with the uh, State of World Health Organization uh, on how they prepare for emergencies and address other global health priorities. Uh, we also work with the G7 health ministers, G20, and other multilateral bodies on this question of how we um, sort of advance health worldwide. But then we also partner with organizations like the Africa CDC, uh, like the Caribbean Public Health Agency and others to really say, okay, what can happen or what's required at the regional level, let alone um, direct partnerships with uh, countries all over the world to advance global health. Obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so a lot of my time has been spent on COVID, uh, as has <laughs> it had been the case for, I think, all of us here. Uh, and yet there's a lot more to public health, obviously, um, beyond COVID-19. And so that's also something we're trying to keep in mind. Um, my office implements the PEPFAR program um, alongside CDC uh, and really tracks how we're advancing that work. We also focus on maternal child health issues um, and other uh, topics such as chronic diseases. And so um, that's something we're keeping in mind throughout this crisis, throughout the pandemic, is how we're really thinking and working holistically across the public health spectrum and ensuring that we're not leaving anyone behind in a number of ways. I think at the end of the day, what we want to accomplish here at HHS is ensure we're advancing health access and health equity, right? COVID has sort of taught us the lesson again we should have learned already about uh, some of these challenges around disparities, around the connection between health and um, say socioeconomic issues like folks are focused on here. And yet, what are we going to do about it? And so that's something that we're working towards even beyond the current crisis is how we finally close these gaps and uh, do better um, for people worldwide when it comes to health. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, thank you so much for that. And so uh, let, let's start this round proper with uh, Nicolet. Uh, time, 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 time. Okay, let's get started. Nicolet, the emergence of the COVID pandemic came as quite a shock to a lot of people, the non-medical experts. As an expert who's had quite some experience dealing with uh, other global health crises like Ebola, you advised the State Department during that crisis. How difficult uh, as this particular challenge uh, being when you compare it to the challenge of Ebola, um, how difficult, how much of a challenge is this? The COVID situation and the Ebola situation. Absolutely. So, um, I, you know, I think John, John said it perfectly, you know, well before there was um, COVID-19, we were um, very concerned about Ebola um, and for very different reasons. So they are very different as, as pathogens, right? So in terms of um, the viruses themselves, the, the way they infect, um, the severity of infection, um, you know, we talk about the idea of having asymptomatic COVID-19 positive patients. There is no such thing as an asymptomatic Ebola positive patient. Um, so they're very different. And so I, but I, I think actually more fundamentally, when we think about um, diseases of pandemic potential, um, whether that be flu, whether that be Ebola, COVID-19, it really comes down to what our infrastructure is, how prepared we are to do the very fundamental work of making sure that we are able to quickly detect, contain, and protect populations until we have a vaccine available or some sort of medicine that can help to treat, and then how well we can work on getting that out. Um, and I think what happened with Ebola um, that didn't quite happen with the beginning of COVID-19 was that rec recognition of early detection and then that work around containment. Um, if you recall when the Ebola crisis began, um, a large amount of resources went specifically into containment, recognizing that if we were at a point where that, that particular pathogen was not just in multiple countries, but multiple continents, it would have been too difficult to contain at that, at that juncture. And the amount of resources that were required to treat a single Ebola patient would have quickly overwhelmed all of the world's health systems. With COVID, on the other hand, you know, we did get some initial signals in December, January, 
of 2020, but we didn't actually mobilize a full global response until months later. And I could even argue that at this point, while we're still working towards a place of full global cooperation around the pandemic, so much of this is happening country by country. Um, and that is actually one of our challenges. Um, so I think they're very different. Um, for, for, you know, medical reasons, but also as it relates to how we coordinated. Um, but I do think one of the common threads is that we have to have that infrastructure um, on hand in advance that allows for us to, to plug in place. And I know in the United States in particular, it's been a continual fight to make the case that yeah. we need to have that infrastructure ready, even when there isn't a major crisis going on. Well, thank you very much for that, Nicholas. Um, very interesting. Uh, John, I, I want to come over to you. Uh, now, right now, we're talking about a vaccination attempt. Uh, are there peculiar challenges with this that are very peculiar to the African content that are totally different when you take a look at other contexts? So, uh, Baba Tunde, the line dropped a little bit when you just started. Can you? Repeat, please. All right. Oh, all right. Uh, sorry about that. I was asking, uh, when it comes to working on the continent, at this particular moment, we're discussing vaccination attempts. Uh, what challenges are peculiar to the continent compared to other spaces around the globe? Are there challenges that are peculiar to us when it comes to vaccination attempts and, you know, talks about vaccine hesitancy amongst a couple of other issues? No, absolutely. Uh, th let me say that there are a couple of um, uh, uh, challenges that we face as a continent. And the, the first for vaccination is a predictable uh, access to vaccines. So uh, I underline the word predictable access to vaccines because uh, the narrative uh, out there is that where vaccines are not being used, there's vaccine hesitancy, but as any program, uh, that you're on, you need to know exactly what kind of vaccines are coming in, when would they come in, and, and what quantities that you can plan. But that has been completely lacking because the continent, uh, a, a vaccine a, a story is very interesting. It is as if uh, you're waiting, okay, you're starving, you're waiting, and then maybe somebody floats around with a, a, a plane full of uh, some and drop uh, things here and there, then you rush towards it, and you grab what you grab. And then you wait again for a couple of months and some other vaccines show up, then it might be that this time is the Pfizer vaccine and then the next time is the Johnson and Johnson. And so because of that, you can't really plan. Okay, you, you just cannot plan. I mean, let me say that the continent is used to vaccinating. In the middle of this crisis, Ethiopia was able to immunize 12 million children with, with, uh, with a measles vaccine, okay, which means if you give them, uh, you tell us that we are going to receive X million doses of certain vaccines by this period, we will be able to put in systems that will accommodate, that will drive that. I uh, remember this is the first time that uh, a, a continent or even the world is trying to immunize uh, millions of adults in a very short period of time. So there's a learning curve there that we need to adjust um, ourselves to. So there's one part of it, which is uh, having access to the vaccines. The second part is the vaccination, rolling out the vaccination itself, which, um, as I said, uh, it is not difficult to do. It just requires resources, predictability of the vaccines. The narrative about vaccine hesitancy, I think, is not static. We were the first group in Africa, Africa CDC, to conduct a large case study of 15,000 participants across 15 countries to, uh, before the vaccines became available. And the simple question we asked in that study it was, if a vaccine was available, will you take it? And the answer ranged from 60% uh, in DRC to 95% in Ethiopia. So we are seeing those trends maintain. But the good news, uh, Babatunde, is that it's, it is not static. You see that uh, each time there's a lot of noise around a, a specific vaccine, it drops. Okay, And then uh, when uh, the, the news gets better, people take up the vaccines. We are going through a very brutal third wave on the continent with 31 countries going through a very severe uh, uh, third wave. Now, if you go to Senegal today with 1 million doses of vaccines, 
those 1 million doses of vaccines will be picked up within two days. Okay, gone. Because everybody is out there on the queue looking for vaccines. If you do that in Botswana, Namibia, Cameroon, whatever, they, they, they are all gone because people are seeing the, the impact and the severity of, of this. It was there because it, it was difficult for uh, any, anyone to, uh, during the first wave, it was very difficult in Africa to see somebody who knew somebody who has died of COVID. But now it's very common to see everybody, okay, that somebody who knows somebody who has died, uh, died of COVID or has been infected with, with COVID. Okay, okay. so I think um, it has changed. People are beginning to see that uh, the vaccine help, they, they save lives and they, they really uh, played a very important role. But so those are some of the challenges that we, we are having as, as a continent. So vaccine hesitancy is not an African issue. It is a more, it's, it's a global uh, issue and has been there before COVID. So I think just so that um, it is clear. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, Lois, I want to come to you. Let's talk about the youth demograph during this time. So young people and the roles they've played. I don't know if uh, there's been a definite, you know, if you've noticed some trends, how impressive has the role of young people been during this period, especially in the area of leading and innovating during this particular public health crisis? Goodness, I think that's a really tough question to answer. I will um, be somewhat general, begging forgiveness of everyone um, <laughs> uh, watching this today and, um, you know, welcome comments and questions in the chat um, in response to this too. Look, I think um, there are a few ways, a number of ways that all people in communities have been active, particularly young people, as you, as you asked. Um, I think when it comes to this question of not just mis or disinformation, but just education and awareness broadly. Um, there's a real opportunity, obviously, of, uh, of people, especially of younger generations, to help mobilize folks um, to line up for vaccines. And I think, to John's point, it's not just about dispelling these myths and misconceptions, although that's a critically important role, particularly in countries like the U.S., where we're very much dealing with this problem, but also just in terms of logistics, right? I think what we've also seen in our own vaccination campaign and campaigns elsewhere is it is unprecedented um, for us to be rolling things out in this way in all of these countries um, and credit to governments um, who are really trying to step up and make this happen, um, building on existing programs, but also credit to communities, families, you know, healthcare providers and others who are also assisting people in finding where they can get that vaccine, you know, understanding um, sort of that they have to go back for a second shot. And I mean, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of um, assistance and navigation required um, with a number of people who have to line up for this, particularly sort of as they get older and maybe um, less savvy about, about how to access uh, some of these products and programs. And so that's one, I think, critical role that, um, that folks here and others in that generation can play. Um, there's also really, I mean, our, our Surgeon General put out an advisory about mis- and disinformation as well. Um, and, yes. and again, again, there's a sort of, you know, broadly speaking, the importance of just education and awareness about how we did, how these vaccines were developed um, and why um, there's so much um, confidence in their effectiveness. Um, but specifically around mis- and disinformation, there's still some steps that people can take uh, in terms of really targeting uh, some of this, you know, bad information and media at the source, uh, really sitting, sitting down with people and sort of addressing their questions head on. Um, I think also to the degree that younger people can help on the social media front. I know it sounds very cliche, um, but there is a lot we can do to report when something looks fishy, right? Not share that information or pass it along. Otherwise, um, really challenge um, all media companies, um, including social media companies, to be more stringent with regards to what's um, available uh, in, the, in the media space, because that is just as virulent as COVID in some ways, right? I mean, that travels thousands of miles around the world. And what people are hearing and seeing here in the States that might be misleading is also being picked up, you know, in Nigeria, in Philippines, and other parts of the world. And I've heard this directly from colleagues, from friends who are sort of sharing the same misinformation. So I think I'm trying to stop that in its tracks for those who are more engaged online in those spaces could be incredibly valuable too. Well, 
Well, thank you very much. You just made my job easier because I was oh. going to ask a question about the misinformation and, you know, disinformation, fake news. You've got a lot there. But thank you so much for speaking about how strategies and approaches and how to you uh, how to handle all of this. Uh, John, I, I want to come to you. Uh, you work on the continent. What are some ways that you think young African professionals in medicine, public health, community health or other sectors, basically people, young people who are at the front line of the pandemic, uh, what ways do you think they can leverage on networks, you know, uh, in the United States and the continent? Are there any examples of existing US-Africa collaborations in this space? No, wonderful. I, I think um, th this crisis is generational, uh, Baba Tunde. I mean, we would, uh, uh, this is, to, uh, to put it very fairly, this is your crisis. Okay, it will be with you. I mean, for we, we are helping now, but we are at the end of our careers. I mean, you would have to carry this on uh, for, for years to come because this is not going to go away. And even if it goes away, there will be consequences of, of this, the disruption that this has created there. So it calls for a, a generational leadership for um, uh, uh, people of your age and the young people on the continent. Remember, 60 to 70 percent of our population in Africa are less than uh, uh, 30 years old. So this is truly uh, work that you have to uh, we, we have to do it. You have to continue doing that. So there is. Um, First of all, if you ask me what um, uh, 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 what has been some of the most important lessons from this crisis, I would say there are two things. I mean, the, the, the behavioral shocks that I, I have, um, uh, that is the gap between uh, uh, the knowledge, the attitudes, and the practice, I mean, uh, of, of this pandemic is really unbelievable. <clears throat> then second is what I call the, the, the limits of optimism. Uh, that I mean, so let me just expand this and why this is important for for the youths, uh, the young people uh, right. to 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 play in this space. There, first of all, the the behavior has been shocking to me at multiple levels. Uh, we have the tools to fight this pandemic. Uh, we know how to do it. Uh, we are better equipped than in 1918, where uh, until the pandemic was over, they didn't even know what they were dealing with. Okay, they didn't even have a test at that time, no, a vaccine. Here we are, we have a test, we, know, we have a vaccine, and we know even a modern uh, epidemiology is, has evolved since 100 years there. But our behavior, what, what I call the four Ps in, in public health, that is the pathogens, understand the pathogen, understand the population, understand policy, and then good wow. politics. If you combine those four Ps there, and it gives you, so the young people really have a, a, a role to play in connecting those four Ps together so that we can begin to change those behaviors there. So I think behavior at individual level, behavior at national level and behavior at regional level. If you see where this pandemic started, Europe was in total disorder. The, the EU is perhaps the most, uh, the, the biggest block that, the, I was sorry, the oldest block that has come to you. But you could see that Italians were not allowed to go to, to France, Germans were not allowed to go to, but it, it, it collapsed the whole thing. But the young people need to come together and say, we can do better in terms of shaping behaviors for the future. Second is the social media. The social media cannot be wished away. Uh, we have to factor that into all responses that we deal with in public health today. That is the number one influential of behavior. I mean, the rate at which people transmit false information is alarming. And the, 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 the anxiety or the ease at which they consume it is also very unbelievable. So if you do a simple exercise, you take facts, send it to your network group, and you see how <clears throat> it dies very quickly. But if you take rumors, circulate it there that this virus was created by somebody, it goes wild and whatever there. So, I mean, who are those who know these tools? The young people right. that can in Africa can do that. All right. Then the, lastly is what I call the, the limit of optimism. We have always believed that uh, and be optimistic that science is the solution uh, to resolving uh, our uh, public health problems. There. But we've seen the limit of that optimism where right. the, uh, diagnostics or vaccines right. are available. But there's a value of that in transferring that those technologies into action into people's arms. Um, we are starving here on the continent not because there are no vaccines. There are, there are vaccines across. So I call on the young people in Africa to work with us right. so that when the vaccines arrive, the continent we should move. We should build a search capacity to put those vaccines into people's arms um, so that the, the value of that is there. So right. those are the two things that I would like to call on the young people right. to work with us. All right.
All right, John, thank you so much for that. Time's the only thing that I could listen to you all all day. But at this point in time, since not to monopolize the conversation, let's have some questions. In. And this one's from Melvin Motsisia Muna. My name is Melvin Muna from Kenya, currently taking the leadership in business and entrepreneurship training at the University of Iowa. My question concerns the coronavirus vaccine uptake in Africa. Currently, Africa has managed to vaccinate just 1.1% of its population. As a key development ally, what is the United States doing to ensure vaccine uptake improves in Africa to ensure people are able to return to their normal lives? Thank you. So we have the verb question. I want to direct this one to Lois. Lois, Pace. Sure, happy to take that on. Uh, well, I, I'm happy that um, we've been able to work, as I mentioned earlier, with the likes of John uh, at Africa CDC, as well as the African Union, to try and get vaccines to the countries or across the continent. Um, we know that there's more to do and it's not enough. And to his point, um, there needs, that needs to happen hand in glove um, with those government officials, with people on the ground who really understand these communities. Uh, but we've been able to deliver 20 million, up to 20 million doses um, to the continent so far um, with aspirations and commitments to send even more again, sort of with on that timeline and with that um, predictability that, that John spoke to. And that is going to be key to ensuring uptake. I mean, he can speak to all this um, much better than I can, right? Knowing um, what the, the needs are on the ground. But um, as he said, we know that there's readiness. Um, it's a matter of of having that supply meet the very real demand, uh, and then supporting um, these organizations and institutions, including community-based organizations, to mobilize um, communities that so that they can receive these vaccines. So very hopeful that we'll see those rates um, tick up in the way that they have in other parts of the world. Again, much more to do, but it is hopefully a strong uh, start to, to an ongoing commitment that we have. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Melvin, I hope that answers uh, your question. Uh, well, uh, we have another one here from uh, Lucindiso Holiday. Uh, it was under the leadership and civic engagement from South Africa, the presidential president. Here it goes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Lucindy So Holiday. I am from South Africa. I am representing the Presidential Precinct Institute. I am from the Civic Leadership Track. And my question is, how does the American government approach the social, behavioral, and structural determinants of health, which are often the primary causes of many health crises? And what lessons can we take from them as, uh, as we are the young African leaders? Thank you. Well, um... Uh, we're back. Uh, Nicolet, uh, would you like to answer that question? Sure, happy to. Um, I, so I think, um, I think one of the biggest lessons um, is that really any, anything is possible um, from, the, from the vantage point that, you know, when we're talking about um, kind of where we go next in public health and how we um, move forward um, and move this field forward, I think, you know, there are principles of leadership that we've seen in, in years past, but I think the creativity, the innovation um, that the younger generation brings to this is really what's desperately needed right now. Um, frankly, the world looks different than it did 50 years ago or even 20 years ago when some of us were trained. Um, so understanding, you know, those principles of leadership, how we're able to think broadly about coordination, how we're able to pull in, you know, unusual partnerships, how we're able to take, you know, challenge models, for example, to boost um, innovation, but doing it in a way that feels authentic um, to them, I think, is, is the real opportunity here. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nicolette, for that. Uh, I have this one uh, that's been sent in. And uh, I want to ask, uh, John, I know you have limited time. We're, we're mindful of that. Just a couple of minutes. I think this is going to be the last question there about. Uh, John, how this one says, how do young people still partner to ensure that authorities do not lose out 
and the attention given to other illnesses like polio, uh, meningitis, <coughs> CSM in Ghana due to COVID-19 claiming all the attention and resources now. I fear our children are at risk of delayed vaccinations. That's Saida Sadek from Ghana. No, wonderful question. Uh, when we conceived our joint continental strategy for the continent and presented to the leadership, the head of state, we had three pillars. I mean, this was 18 months ago. The first pillar was to prevent deaths. Uh, second was to prevent tran uh, uh, limit transmission. And then third was harm. So the harm there was de very deliberate. The harm on non-COVID uh, uh, um, illnesses, the, the, the endemic diseases that we face, the immunization programs there, because we knew. I mean, from history, and uh, if you have been in public health for long, uh, you know that these pandemics or outbreaks tend to disrupt and the consequences are far reaching, not because of the, 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 the deaths from the, the, the outbreak or pandemic, but due to the pandemic. So in other words, many more people will die from HIV, TB, malaria, uh, 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 than they will die from, from COVID. And we have to factor that into, into that. But I've been, and there's some data, statistics already, and um, evidence showing that that, that has happened and it's, it will continue to happen. So, but the first thing is that Unfortunately, we, we, we have to get rid of COVID in order to get back uh, to addressing those, uh, those challenges there because it's all over. The COVID is not just a disease, uh, but the power of disruption uh, is amazing. I mean, it's, uh, it's just uh, uh, so disruptive and it, 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 be, it begins to ad attack the economic basis of our own uh, uh, societies, which is where the, 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 the dimension that is important in fighting other diseases. So in other words, if we keep doing the lockdowns, and continuously during the third wave, the fourth wave, economies suffer, the money that country are supposed to generate to fight those other diseases that is not there, so that you get into this vicious cycle. So it's very important that in as much as we think of how do we fight those other diseases, we, we, we focus on, on COVID, mm. get it out. I mean, it's like to just conclude, it's like your house is on fire. The first thing you do is that you know that you have an, an emergency. When you're done with the emergency, you face the crisis. The crisis is that your, your poor home has been run down. You have to go into a crisis mode of rebuilding that home. So that is that a crude analogy of uh, describing the, the COVID situation and other endemic uh, illnesses that we have to fight. Wow, thank you so much. There's so many beautiful, brilliant questions right here. I'm, it's a struggle right now because uh, we, have, uh, we have just uh, about uh, six minutes more. And then it's a wrap on this. But very quickly, um, Nicolette, I think this one's uh, for you. What have we learned from the COVID-19 outbreak that the Ebola outbreak of 2014 did not teach us? And in line with that, how do we address the disconnect between the lessons learned during epidemics and using that information for action, for better preparedness? That's from Rahil Lema Yemen uh, Berhan from Ethiopia. Did you get that, Nicolette? I did. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I think one of the things that we've learned from COVID that we've, um, we, I, I don't know that we learned from Ebola. We heard it, but I don't think we act, um, actually embodied it, is that leadership matters. Um, when we're thinking about um, how we've been able to move forward, where we have um, left to advance in COVID, it's not just about public health leadership. And so oftentimes we pivot and say, what's the health ministry? Minister doing? Uh, what are health companies doing? But it, it really is about national and international leadership as well. Um, where we've been able to go as it relates to fighting misinformation has been driven by information coming out of the UN system. What we've been able to see as it relates to not just mm -hmm. the public health supports, but also the supports that have allowed people to sustain and survive and live through the pandemic have come from presidents. And, and I think it's really important to take that, that holistic view of not just one type of leadership, not just the health leaders doing their part, which is critical. And I think we've seen that in a way in COVID that we got to avoid with Ebola because in some ways um, we were able to con contain Ebola at particular points where we saw the leadership in West right. Africa st step up. We saw leadership in the United States step up, but it didn't require the entire globe. So that to me is one big um, lesson that I hope we carry out from this. The other is that it doesn't take 
um, a pathogen like Ebola. So it can be something that does lead to some people being asymptomatic and some people being fatally sick. Um, and understanding that even in an instance where not everyone is going to be lethally sick and see fatality, do we have to mount a full-scale global response? Wow. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, we have to uh, sign out. We've just, just got a couple of minutes left. But I want you, Lois, um, to give a call of action. What's a call to action that you would give to young African professionals in medicine, public health, and community health on the continent? Very quickly, please. I think I'll pull from um, something Nicola um, said earlier, just about being ready, right? Which is her whole mission right now with everything that she's doing. We not only need to respond to this crisis, but we need to be ready for the next one because the next one's coming, right? If, if history's taught us nothing, is that we'll have to face something like this again. Hopefully not at this scale, but let's be ready. And John said, you know, there is so much talent and promise awaiting us in you, right? And there are a number of resources beyond Yali um, that you could tap. I know in the U.S. we have these epidemiology training programs, lab training programs, other programs through the CDC that are available and accessible. We also have research grants through our NIH for those of you who like to dig into data and try to advance health and through research and through those means and, and discovery. And then there are a number of other opportunities, I'm sure, that are available. But if this is something that you're interested in, now is the time. And if I imagine there will be many more opportunities that emerge now that everyone truly understands even more fully how critical it is to focus on health because it's the gateway uh, to everything we do. So that's, that's my call to action for what it's worth. And again, thanks to each of you for being as engaged as you are. Thanks for allowing me to be a part of this discussion too. Thank you. Thank you. A big thank you uh, to uh, John Kengasong. A big thank you to Lois Space. And a big thank you to you, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time's the only thing we don't have. I could talk to you all every day. And I know you're really, really busy people. So this means a lot to young people out there and uh, to my colleagues and uh, fellow Mandela Washington, fellow alumni. And, you know, few of, you know, it's uh, it would be interesting, I think, to know and to figure out how history, uh, what history will say about this particular point in time of history. Well, the great part is that it has still been written and we can still play a part, which is all this is all about. A big thank you to our amazing panelists. A big thank you to you fellows for participating and we wish you the best. We celebrate you. A big thank you to the technical committee and everyone who has made this happen.